The North American indigenous tribes, despite their remote distance from the rest of the world, in many of their traditions and customs were in some ways similar to ordinary white people, as much as to the rest of the world. This was especially so in regard to relations between men and women. There were differences, of course, but there were also the so-called classical things, given, of course, the specifics of the peoples themselves and the regions in which they lived. Today we will tell you about specifics of relationships between men and women among Native American tribes. You're watching Flip Side of History. Relationships The intimacy as well as close relationships were regulated in different ways in different tribes. However, the total number of various prohibitions and superstitions was huge. For example, the Apache believed that any relationship was forbidden during the agave harvest, where the fruit would be unsavory. Men of many tribes refused intimacy before their journeys so as not to lose their strength. On the contrary, the Comanches spent almost all their time in the arms of their beloved, before their campaigns. The intimacy itself had a different intention from tribe to tribe. Some considered it only a way to conceive a child, while others a way to get satisfaction for the men, and no one really cared about the women's satisfaction. The Shoshone and Comanche went the most far in prohibitions, who could even punish a woman brutally if she did not keep her knees together when she was in public. In addition to restrictions, intimacy had ritual significance among Native Americans. For one example, the Mandan tribe had women and girls wrapped only in skins bring food into the tent of the elders during the ritual of inviting the buffalo. After the tribal chiefs were filled, young women took them to the forest, where the elders would indulge in pleasures that had ritual significance. There was even a rule that one woman should pay attention to at least ten old men during the night. However, it was not always the case, since the old men themselves were no longer able to do it, so they simply prayed in the woods for a successful hunt. During intimacy, kissing was excluded for the sake of the health of the future offspring. The heaviest crime The crime of rape was considered to be the most terrible, so the perpetrator could face the harshest punishment, up to and including the death penalty. Yet in practice, the victim or her relatives often accepted a payoff from the perpetrator, and the case was over. For the sake of fairness, it must be said that the compensation by Native American standards was often quite considerable. In each tribe, however, such crimes had their own peculiar traits. For example, young Apache men forced intimacy on women who refused to marry them. After the beloved had been degraded, it was not uncommon for relatives to offer the offender a marriage, which he did with great pleasure. In the Zuni tribe, as a rule, such a man was tried in public, and the verdict was pronounced by the victim of the abuse. If the victim asked for death of the abuser, the perpetrator was executed without any regret, but, as mentioned above, most often the victim asked for material compensation, which was quite high. In the Ojibwe tribe, women were openly afraid of acts of violence, and this fear was incited by the local shamans. An interesting peculiarity is that in this tribe the foreman himself acted as an offender. The shaman first warned the victim of the allegedly imminent visit of an enchanter in the body of another man, and then he himself appeared. In theory, a woman or a girl could not even refuse, because the shaman was the most powerful and threatening man of the tribe. In this case, the shaman could always get rid of the deed by claiming that his body had been taken advantage of by the spirit of his devotee. In the same tribe, it was characteristic to dishonor stepdaughters. The maximum punishment was the mother and daughter leaving the husbands. Body Disposition Native Americans did not have prostitution in the classical sense, but there were traditions that, to some extent, could be interpreted in this respect. For example, among the Creeks it was believed that even a married woman had the right to dispose of her body, at her own free will. Therefore, a woman of the tribe had every right to offer herself for the night to a passerby or a guest. But the Salish tribe even had a group of women, married and single, who were obliged to share the bed with whomever the elders pointed out to them. The tribe was generally characterized by polygamy, and like the Creeks, the woman had the right to dispose of her body as she wished. By all accounts, giving a wife to a guest or traveler was a common practice in many tribes. Some chiefs even specially went to visit a neighboring tribe, knowing that there he would be offered a charming tribeswoman for the night. In this case, a woman's consent was not required, since the men themselves decided whom to send to the bed with the guest. The matter was similar to the Omaha tribe, 
though if the relatives thought that the woman was too fond of disposing of her own body, she could be given a punishment for it. The Papago tribesmen allowed special girls and women during various festivals, who could create a short-term relationship for the duration of the celebration. The young women danced decorated with various drawings and corn leaves. The man who liked someone would take the chosen one to himself, creating a family for a short time. It could occur that such a relationship ended in the creation of a family. If not, the relatives raised the children as full-fledged members of the tribe. Finally, Papago's neighbors, the Pima people, had a separate category of so-called women seducers. No one thought anything shameful about such an occupation, and women decided for themselves whether to be model wives or bride women, who waited for the next holiday to give themselves to a new man. Payback for cheating in spite of the fact that to some extent the relationship between a man and a woman among the Native Americans was relatively free, adultery was often punished more than harshly. The only exception was the Hopi tribe, which allowed a man to have a so-called private wife, in addition to his lawful wife. Other tribes punished adulterous wives and, in fact, unfaithful husbands at the same time. The matter is that before marriage a man actually bought his wife by giving rich offerings to her relatives. Consequently, a wife was considered personal property and an offense against her was considered a crime. The Comanches could either expel unfaithful wives from the tribe or sell them into slavery. Afterwards, the unhappy woman could be shaved or beaten. Eventually, the unfaithful wife would be returned to her relatives. Often cheating wives were simply taken to the forest and tied to a tree, after which the unhappy wife would be an easy prey for predators. In reality, punishments varied from tribe to tribe. But to be fair, the men themselves could also be the ones to pay for infidelity. If, for example, a husband caught his wife in the arms of another man, he had every right to kill them both. Moreover, it is interesting how women who suspected that their husbands were about to be seduced or had already been seduced behaved. For example, Shoshone tribes women would publicly insult their rival by throwing mud. The insulted wife's task was to publicly show her contempt for her female rival. Describing all her flaws, interestingly, a woman in a stroke of jealousy could even kill her husband. As the rule, there was no punishment for that. But no one was going to live with such a woman afterwards. That was why, in fact, it was a death sentence. After all, the man was the main provider, and if there was no provider, no one would simply feed the family. Thank you for watching our episode. Subscribe, leave a like, and apart from that, watch our other videos on Flipside of History.